Now, I didn't come to Australia with the plan at that time for PR, right? It was chase the girl, see what happened. And I remember mum and dad saying, when you finish, come back, right? And, and it'll be a great opportunity to find work in, in KL. And it was only towards the end that I thought, oh, I actually want to make something of this. I want to stay. And I started looking into options on how I'd stay. And at that time, you know, it was the age of, of accountants and engineers and all that sort of jazz. And I, I did a degree in business management and human resource management and industrial relations. So I wasn't on any list at the time, right? So the only option was go out regional. So I started looking around, what is regional? And the closest regional city to Brisbane was Toowoomba. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm your host, Rob Maliki. Thanks for your company. And today I'm coming to you from somewhere special. I'm coming to you from Ghana country in Adelaide, down here for work. It's one of the beautiful things about international ed is getting to travel and hang out with awesome colleagues. And today's guest is no exception. Rishan Shekhar from the University of South Australia. Thanks for joining me, mate. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for uh, having us today. <laughs> this is going to be great fun. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And to, to paint a picture for our listeners, it's a beautiful Brisbane day. The sky is blue. It's the 21st of February, 2002. And you've just been dropped off at a motel on the outskirts of Brisbane in Ipswich. And you've picked up the phone and you've called your mum and you've said to her, Mum, I think I've made a terrible, terrible mistake. What happened next? Well, we're going back 20 odd years here, right, Rob? So long story short, I, I walked the traditional international student journey. So six months before that, take yourself to downtown Kuala Lumpur. I was at a one of those five-star hotels and there was the Star Education Fair. And I was there uh, walking around the booths, speaking to one of many university representatives. But the real reason that I was there wasn't to find out about international education or studying abroad. It was about, I got two hours with this girl that I was sort of hot for at the time. Uh, and it meant that I could have a quasi date without asking her on a date, right? So she was quite keen on, on doing her studies in, in Australia and, and had made up her mind that she was looking at a, a couple of group of eight universities at the time. And she said, oh, well, why don't we we go in and, and put our applications in and have a chat. So, and th that's what I did. So I went to the Star Education Fair. I, I, I talked to a couple of representatives. I put in a couple of applications. Fast forward six months later, I uh, was picked up from Brisbane Airport, taken by a wonderful representative from the University of Queensland, dropped off at this motel. And when I looked out of the motel room, I saw a paddock full of cows and horses. And, and I come from sort of downtown KL City bustling, right? And so this was a bit of a shock. And I, and I, I, I tried to ask around where the university was and, and someone said I oh, just up there near the, the showgrounds in Ipswich and uh, I could see it and it was it wasn't sort of my picture it wasn't what I had pictured in my head right I, I thought brick sprawling Brisbane University campus in, in UQ in St Lucia and despite the fact that I spoke perfect English and understood the language and had access to all the brochures it was just slightly before a lot of internet searching in 2002 I, I rang mum I said mum look I, I think I've made a really big mistake I think I've picked the wrong university or picked the wrong city. I should have gone to Melbourne or and, and should have gone to Monash because that's what most people from Malaysia did back in the day. You'd go and study at Monash University. And mum says, look, I don't want to make this any worse for you, but the offer letter for Monash landed today at home. And she goes, but, she goes, son, give it six months. Just, just sit around, give it a go, see what it's like. And if you don't enjoy it and you don't, it's not the right thing for you, we can always apply for a transfer. And I tell you, till today, Rob, that was the best advice my mum ever did, right? She, the opportunities I got in that smaller uh, community of Ipswich, and I call it regional, the people I met, the lifelong friendships, the opportunities and the doors that it opened, I wouldn't have got if I went elsewhere. I don't think anyway. I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit emotional, man. I've got so many questions, but I know, like, your mum's no, no longer with us. No, mum, mum is here. Dad's oh, no longer with us. Yep, but yeah. I didn't get to talk to dad that day. Mum's, mum's <laughs> around. Mum's around, and and we often, you know, my sister still lives in Brisbane, so we often do a trip down memory lane. When I go back to Brisbane, we drive the kids around, we show them where I studied. And honestly, Rob, for me, that you know, I met some of the most wonderful people, both at university but within the community there so I've got so many good memories and you know it's one of those things I'm a big believer in fate and things happen for a reason and, and to me that was one of the best acts of fate that I've seen. Okay so now I've got so many questions but I have to ask the obvious one because listeners would kill me if I didn't ask us what happened to the girl? 
nothing happened with the girl, unfortunately. She actually managed to study at the St. Lucia campus while I was out in Ipswich. And, you know, the 40-minute train ride didn't, didn't lead to much else at all, but certainly led to many other things that have happened, including some of my the best friends I've made over the years. Amazing connections. Uh, I started off my career in international education. By default, I didn't, even know, I didn't even know it was a career or a sector back in those days, but I started off, I arrived in February, and by March, I found some accommodation a week later. But by March, I was working as a uh, the equivalent of a resident advisor at a local PBSA in Ipswich that the university had sort of set up with some private investors and it was a 300 bedroom complex and uh, I sort of became the assistant manager and was involved in setting up the, the accommodation, setting in students and that was the beginning falling into the laps of international education. And that, that was early too, I mean early in terms of on-campus accommodation being run by external providers. Very early. I, I, in fact, I, I'd, I'd almost go and say it would have been one of the first five or ten that was set up back in those days. And, you know, it was a bunch of investors that thought this is a great opportunity to set up some internet, some accommodation right next to the university. And, yeah, we, we, it was very quickly full back in those days. And so, and I have to ask this one too, so how, how did you end up at Ipswich instead of St Lucia? Bizarre. You know, I applied for a program and, you know, I didn't pay attention to the offer letter. It just said the University of Queensland. You know, the brochure said it was 40 minutes. There was no no, no, no sort of um, miscommunication anywhere. I just, I, I suppose I wasn't paying attention. And I think this could happen to anyone, right? And I think it continues to happen to students who, who don't look into the detail. But I was just too excited about travelling, moving countries, and I didn't pay attention to the detail. And I didn't realise. I remember arriving at the airport crossing the story bridge going how amazing is this city that i've moved into went on the story bridge then jumped on the the motorway and he kept going and 20 minutes in i remember asking the driver i said look how much further is this campus and she goes oh, it's still another 20 minutes away mate and as soon as we turned off the ipswich motorway onto the actual ipswich city i remember going this ain't what i signed up for you know have you ever thought back and wondered what life might look like now if you had ended up at St Lucia? I haven't put too much thought in it, Rob, but I've always said I wouldn't have had the opportunities because I would have been comfortable, right? If I'd gone to, to Melbourne, which is you know, a fantastic city, but um, I, I would have been with fellow Malaysian students, with the lots of friends. I wouldn't have to have got out as much as I did out of my comfort zone because moving to, to Ipswich, I knew no one. I knew nobody there. I had no connections. I, and, and I had to get out of that comfort zone, which made me make, I think, some better decisions and, and made me grow up real quick, real quick. And from there, I mean, once you, once you ended up in international ed, you've been to other places that is kind of outside the comfort zone for a lot of international educators, Toowoomba, yep, New Toowoomba, England. New England. Tell me about those experiences. I mean, having, having kind of moved even further out from, you know, metropolitan area out to some, you know, more regional parts of Australia. I mean, it is the classic international student's journey, Rob. For me, you know, I was comfortable. I'd finished my degree halfway between in 2004. I had started classes in, in St. Lucia at that stage. So I was living, I was still living in Ipswich because I was still doing some work for the PBSA at the time. And then the reality of putting in my PR. And I didn't come to Australia with the plan at that time for PR, right? It was chase the girl, see what happened. And I remember mum and dad saying, when you finish, come back, right? And, um, and it'll be a great opportunity to find work in, in KL. And it was only towards the end that I thought, oh, I actually wanted to make something of this. I want to stay. And I started looking into options on how I'd stay. And at that time, you know, it was the age of, of accountants and engineers and all that sort of jazz. And I, I did a degree in business management and human resource management and industrial relations. So I wasn't on any list at the time, right? So the only option was go out regional. So I started looking around. What is regional? And the closest regional city to Brisbane was Toowoomba. Never been up there, but I put in for about 40 jobs, got knocked back for quite a few of them, and saw an ad one day for an international admissions officer, HEO5, at the University of Southern Queensland. And I, I'd been working in, in uh, HR and recruitment. I sort of knew, you know, admin processes, could do that sort of stuff reasonably well. It's good people, they were, and, and I was an international student. I thought, oh, worth a shot. So I put in the application, moved up to, uh, applied for the job in Toowoomba, got called for an interview, and met my boss of 17 years, it continues to be my most boss, Gabrielle Rowland there, but also oh, she, was she was USQ. Gabrielle Rowland hired me. UNA. Uh, uh, and I followed her to Union, Union USA. So I've been quite a loyal supporter, 
Rob, and, and I'll, I'll probably get an opportunity to talk about, you know, choosing good bosses. But, but that was a bit of destiny, right? I ended up, uh, I met Gabrielle there. She interviewed me with a, 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 a bit, bit of a large panel. Found out after the interviews that there were 97 applications and they hired something like four or five uh, admissions officers. One of which the other turned out to be my wife. Right, so we, I met my wife, Alicia, on the 2nd of January 2007 when I relocated to Toowoomba to work as an international admissions officer at the University of Southern Queensland. That was the motivation, mate. True, true story, wasn't anything else. I had to get up to Toowoomba for regional reasons and, and migration and end up meeting my wife. Let's go back there because a lot of people haven't been in the industry that long. It's still a relatively young workforce. What was it like working in international ed back in the early, mid to mid noughties, so to speak? It was, you know, we were flying by the seeds of our parents, right? We were a small regional university that had a very successful transnational footprint. So we were delivering to quite large numbers in, in Malaysia. We were delivering to students in Sri Lanka. And, you know, I often tell a story about, I remember in admissions those days, there, there were no online systems. We, was, we, we just started building an online system when I got to USQ. But we were measuring applications by the meters. We'd get applications in and we'd print them off and they'd be stapled or they'd be posted into us. And I remember walking in some days and say, I've got a knee-high pile of applications to work through. And, I mean, it was, I don't know how we did some of that stuff, Rob. You know, but we had a, a great leadership team at the university. We had a, a faculty of business in particular at the time that was very keen to grow its international profile. And we just had a lot of support and we had, a, you know, Gabriel was the director at the time. We had a, a fantastic PVC International, Tim Fowler, that had come in from New Zealand. And, and they were given the imprimatur by senior leadership to really make change. And, and that's what they did, right? They restructured, they reorganized, they brought in the right people, they brought in processes, they funded it up. And, uh, and, and we turned sleepy little Toowoomba back in those days into what's now become, I think, a, a fantastic international study destination, right? They've done very, very well out of it. And I've got a, and I, you know, I have such fond memories of Toowoomba that when I decided uh, after moving to Brisbane many years later when I proposed to Alicia, I took her back to the Japanese gardens in uh, Toowoomba on campus and proposed to her there because that's where we were, you know, sneaking away for lunch dates when we're trying to hide our relationship very early in the days. That's so good. It's amazing to look back on that period because I feel like the leadership that was around, and amazing you're still working for Gabrielle. Sure. I mean, I, I, I knew about you, which was at UNE, yeah. but didn't realise that that connection went all the way back to USQ. But that kind of generation of leaders that was so visionary of what this industry could become because it was so early on. I mean, now we take it for granted. It's so sophisticated. You have so many other providers that are sort of helping prop it up. But back then it was just... It was just the people in the international offices essentially making it work. It was, you know, and you think back, and you know, obviously Gabrielle's one that I hold in, in a lot of very high esteem, but you think about people like Stephen Connolly, Jeffrey Smart, John Maloney, uh, Joe Asquith, you know, back in those days, you know, Chris Madden, Griffith. Uh, I mean, these guys had a vision for what international could be. And, you know, we owe a lot to these, uh, I, I often call them godparents of the industry, because, you know, they, they had faith, they, they got people on board, um, and they were visionary. And I'm, I'm very grateful to have been surrounded by so many of those and been, been able to witness some of that in the very early piece. And so then what was it like moving from Toowoomba down to Armidale in New England in, in New South Wales? Yeah, look, and again, that was an interesting one, Rob, because before the before I moved to UNE, I actually worked with studying. Oh, of course. Right, yep. I, mm -hmm. I was part of the early ed tech revolution with Jason Howard, you know, and Jonathan Pratt at StudyLink. And, you know, I, I caught up and had dinner actually last week on Thursday with, with Jason when he was here. And we, you know, we, we had a, a, a long chat and a, and a walk down memory lane when we looked at what was StudyLink back in those days and having to go out and explain to education agents about, you know, using an application system for them doing data entry early in the piece. You know, and I remember speaking to many agents at the time that thought, you know, why is the university making me do your job? You should be data entering and stuff. So yeah, so I, I actually went in between, did a couple of years with Jason, worked with him and the team on rolling out StudyLink Connect early in the piece, worked closely with Griffith and Macquarie and Navitas at the time and, and, a, and about a thousand education agents around the world. And then, you know, an opportunity came knocking. Gabrielle sort of said, hey, there's a, there's a regional manager role that's available for the University of New England would you be interested and I said yes but I can only work out of Brisbane and again I think that the the, the visionary in Gabrielle at the time was we started a very early 
in the peace, working from home relationship. My wife Alicia was working at Griffith University. We just had a bub and I was very fortunate when Alicia went back to work that I was still working at home. I remember being on early Skype calls with Armadale and, and rocking my you know 18-month-old baby at the time while having meetings back in the day. And that was almost 10, 12 years ago. I was privileged to still represent Armadale and work for the University of New England, but only have to be there when I really needed to be physically. The rest of the time I was based remotely from home. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, UNE, a lot of people might not know that because now digital is so pervasive and everybody can work remotely, but UNE had, and perhaps still does to some extent, has one of the best distance education programs. I mean, the university was founded on this principle of making education available to people um, as a rural institution, you know, all over the region, all over the country even. And internationally as well, right? And internationally, you know? yeah. They were very early in adopting online for international as well. So again, you know, a niche provider that had to think outside the box yeah. on how do we grow our international, or how do we grow our institution as well. Huge hats off to what UNE has achieved since then. So what have you learned from that? So you've, you've, you know, talking about niche providers and trying to find that unique selling point, if you want, for an institution. What have you learned about that through your various experiences? I think the biggest thing for me, Rob, is I've got to believe in what I sell. I'm not a salesperson. As much as people think, you know, I'm, I'm sort of loud and obnoxious at times and, and, and tend to be quite vocal about things, I can only do that when I genuinely believe in an institution. And when I came up for the UNE interview and, and met with Gabrielle and the team there, you could see that they were genuine. You could talk to the international students at the time, many of which lived on campus because they've got a fantastic network of residential colleges on campus, right? And the community in Armadale needed the students to come there and looked after them. And when you spoke to the students, they were always well looked after. They had time to meet with the academics. They could get an appointment. They could get face-to-face -face contact and feedback on what they've done right and what they've done wrong. UniSA was the same thing. My sister was a graduate of UniSA years before and I'd come for a, a, a graduation ceremony. And I remember the vice chancellor at the time, Peter Hoy, making the graduates stand up, turn around and clap and thank their families. And I thought it was a really you know, it was a very touching moment that that acknowledgement was given. But again, my sister till today talks about her experience in Adelaide and that, you know, led to me giving this a go and moving to Adelaide. So I think for me, it's about I genuinely got to believe in the institution. And for me, Adelaide is a destination now. I live and breathe it. It's best, the best decision we've made as a family, particularly with young kids moving to Adelaide. We love it here. So for me, it's, it's about being at the right institution that shares some of the beliefs that I've got. And I'm pretty stubborn about that, right? There, there are a lot of institutions I probably wouldn't work for because I don't agree perhaps to how they conduct themselves. I think the why of why people are doing this job is really important, isn't it? Because it's so easy to look at it on the surface and say, oh, it's a trans you know, $30 billion. And yeah, all of that's an argument as to why government should put um, more, oh, should support us a lot more, let's be, let's be honest. Yeah. But, I mean, that's such a small part of the overall story of international ed, wouldn't you say? We change people's lives. International education changes people's lives, you know, and till today, you know, 17 years or whatever it is that I've been in the sector, I will always walk around campus and if I see a random student walk around, I tend to chat them up and I just say, well, what's it like? Where are you from? What have you been doing? How have you been settling in? Are you happy? Right? Because we are, when you break it down, we are dealing with individual people that have made huge sacrifices to get here. Some might have more than others, but we are playing with people's lives here. So I really think that, you know, we, we owe it. We owe it to international students to do the right thing by them. We owe it to make sure that they get the return on investment because for many of them, this is a huge investment. You know, I, and I look back at my journey again, and I, I say this to a lot of people, mum and dad mortgaged the house three times to put three kids through university, one, one through med school in Ireland. So it wasn't a cheap affair. But so for us, there was a big investment going into this, right? And I think if for many of us, when many of you when, you, when you're walking around, you talk to students, they've all got a story. So we've just got to acknowledge it. It's not a number. It's not a dollar. Yes, we've got KPIs. Yes, we've got targets. But it is very much about what can we do. We've got to make sure we do the right thing for these students. And that's everything from an experience to how we treat them when they get here to the outcome, right? At the end of the day, for many of these students, this international degree is a way to a better life. So we've got to make sure that we prepare them for employment because that's the biggest ROI for many of them. They've got to get a good job. And this, that, that's what sets them up and then helps change things back home for them, right? So... So I, I often say to anyone on my recruitment panel, my staff and my team know this very well, we recruit to values and, and we don't hire salespeople, we hire counsellors 
and, and that's what our recruitment team here is about. It's about people that genuinely believe in what we do and people like that tend to sit and that's why I've got a very stable management team that's been around for a long time is that we, we recruited on, on people that believe in the same thing. Do you think Australia's doing a good enough job? As a broad, not, let's not dive into individuals or individual institutions, but Australia as a whole, are we doing a good enough job to respect that massive decision that people are making? I think we've done a good job, but I think there's room for improvement there, Rob. And I think the rhetoric, and we spoke about this at lunch today, has been shifting a little bit, right? If we're going to take the money, then we've got to do the right thing. And I think we've got to ensure that we can do the right thing. And I think there's a lot of things that we do well, right? There's a lot of things. I mean, the, the opportunities we offer international students, the protection that we've got around legislation for international students, we do some of this stuff really, really well, right? But yeah, I think there is always room for improvement. And I think in recent times, that's becoming slightly more obvious. That's so true, isn't it? And the thing is, is there's a big disparity between what we in the industry see and know and do and what the politics drives, for example, in the media. And at lunchtime we were talking mm. about, you know, I was re recounting a story about you know, somebody, somebody in my friendship circle that I met recently who said, oh, you know, the problem at the moment is all of these international students stealing accommodation and, you know, basically driving up the cost of housing. And I, I'd said to them, yeah, but what about the businesses that need the skilled labour? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. That that's important, of course. And I said, well, what about the fruit pickers? You know, the the, the farms that need the need the fruit picked. Oh well, yeah. There's that too. But but outside of it, and you kind of forget that the problem is not the international students. It's two or three decades of neglect of governments of all persuasions to actually create effective housing policies. Right, and, and it, it washes out on our industry. It is, and and you know, it, it's easy to point fingers like that, isn't it? I mean, but no one's then going around, well, what about the milk bar that benefits from the students buying, international students buying food from them or groceries from them? What about the, the industries that rely? I mean, the, 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 the wine industry, the... There's a whole bunch of stuff here in South Australia that rely, the community relies on international students, right? Not just from an economic point of view, from a cultural point of view, everything. So as part of your work, you've had the opportunity to travel pretty extensively around the world. What's your favourite place and why? I feel like I'm being set up for a bit of a trick question here, Rob, because there, there will be people listening to this podcast that will be education partners that I've worked with for many years that I've always said, oh, you know, Vietnam's my favourite place, Sri Lanka. And I, well, I mean that genuinely. Let, let, uh, me, let me let me re-ask you that in a different <laughs> way because that's a fair call. It's a fair call and, it's, it's hard. and we, we love them all, don't we? I mean... What? I think every place has a, has a story, right? And for me, it's, it's, you know, with the line of work that we do, Rob, we, we tend to just spend a lot of time in hotel rooms, airports. But I, I try, even till today, I try and when I land or if I've got time, I try my best not to have a meal in the hotel. And, and I try to find a local bar or a local restaurant. So I really try and make the most of my travel where I can. You know, the, for me, I think that the glamour of travel and hotels that that's worn off a, a couple of years ago right now travel takes away from time with my kids takes away time from the family which i know I, so i try and make the most and the best of it by making memories and i'm, I'm big about making these sort of memories and often as you can tell you can't because i'm on a podcast I, most of those memories are around food rob but it is important so i i i don't i i really struggle to talk about best for me there's a certain feeling and i won't lie about landing in kl because it is home and the familiarity of home and i've seen the country change over the years so if I had to pick one I'd say landing in KL and, and going out to a night market or a hawker stall dinner in, in, in PJ or KL would be one of my happy places. And if I could give you a, a magic airplane ticket and you could take you and your family anywhere in the world let's let's take KL out of it because fam that's family but if you could go anywhere in the world with your family Direct flight straight out of Adelaide to Ooh. you know where. Where would you go? Where would you go? Mate, you know, it's funny. I've had this conversation with Alicia in the last couple of years and I would really like a trip to a small little village outside Italy somewhere where I can stay at a lovely little Airbnb motel sort of thing. But I'd really love to sit there. I'd like to squash tomatoes, make sugo, learn to make gnocchi, pasta, and make a pomodoro or something like that with an Italian nonna and cook, and just drink some lovely Barolo or something like that, right? I, I have this thing about wine and pasta and Italian food and the simplicity of that whole experience that I'd like to do one day. I've never had the opportunity, I would love to, and I just want to be able to enjoy the simple pleasures. So that would be it, mate. Somewhere in the Italian hillside somewhere. Where does your curiosity come from? I mean, here you talk, you've talked so much about these different cultures, and yeah, you work in international ed, but but before that, like, where where did that curio where does that curiosity come from? Look, 
I think I've tried to put my finger on it, right? And I think this whole interest in cultures came from the fact that, so, uh, you know, I was born in the early 80s. Uh, uh, I was born in 82. My sister was born in 83. My parents packed us up in 85, so I was three, and moved us to Boston. Mum got a scholarship uh, from the Malaysian government to do her postgraduate qualifications at Boston University and dad took the opportunity at the time to do his uh, Masters of Public Health at John Hopkins. So we moved to Boston and this was in the 80s mate. This was flying via Pan, I think, and then another stop somewhere before we got into to Boston. No friends, no family. Luckily enough at the time, my dad's mum, my grandma, offered to come along and look after us kids with two parents doing a postgrad. There was no way we were parents were going to manage, so my grandma came with us, didn't speak much English at all, just, just came along. And so the house at the time was filled with, you know, dad and mum's international colleagues or, or their American classmates showing us around, taking us out you know, fruit picking. And then subsequent years after that, because of those international connections, the house was always filled with one of dad's academic friends dropping in to stay for a week or a month because they were doing postdoc research with dad, right? So this was, my dad was an academic. And so this was built into us. We were constantly surrounded by culture. My dad also had 13 brothers and sisters, all of which have married some sort of different nationality, religion or race, right? So we, we're like the United Nations of families and we've always grown up that way. And, and I think that's, probably what built the seed like and I enjoy that whole multicultural environment Rob I I love the fact that till today we walk into a, a yam cha or a, or a Chinese restaurant and people stare in amazement at my boys as they chomp on chicken feet because they're like what are these kids on like why why are they chomping on chicken feet but culturally we've always brought them to believe in try everything do things differently expose be uncomfortable eat the grasshopper you know, chew on the scorpion, whatever it is, as cliche as it sounds. But we've always said, try, have something. And I think that, that, that excites me. That whole cultural side of things really genuinely excites me. That explains the food thing too, yeah. doesn't it? Because everything is about that, that beautiful meal you have with someone where you share, you share food, you share stories, and that's connection, isn't it? It, it is, Rob. And, and, and then you add that with a, a bottle, wonderful bottle of wine, and you're just happier. And, and I think that's why I've loved Adelaide. It's that, that cultural aspect, and then the, the, the wine, and the, the whole cult concept between food and wine, and so much so that during COVID, I, I started doing some study. And, and so I've, I've completed my first level of uh, a Wesset qualification, which is a wine and spirit education trust qualification level one. I'm preparing for my level two, but it, it's all just this. I, I love this whole correlation between food, wine, family, experience, storytelling. You know, it's, it's, it's my happy place. Jumping back to, to your parents, they, they were courageous. That was a massive call. I mean, I don't know their, their background, but huge decision in the 80s to move with your family to the other side of the world. What was in their backgrounds that made them even A, think about that and, and B, give them like the, the fearlessness, I suppose, to just pack up and, and move? I am frankly very surprised, Rob, because we, my parents both come from very middle income average families in Malaysia, right? I think one thing that I can put it down to is dad. So dad, when he finished his high school qualifications and started looking around for universities, unfortunately, just the way that things are in Malaysia, there are there are rules around public education in terms of your background, your religion, where you come from and, and quotas and stuff like that. So that, that was obviously complicated. So dad tracked around the world at the time. And, and, and actually, he was an international student in the 70s because he went to India to start off his medical degree. And so he studied in India, and then after he finished his undergrad, he moved and, and did his postgrad qualifications in Bangladesh before civil war hit. Dad had already had this background of, of international education, and he was born out of necessity more than anything else. He had to go and get something. But we also were surrounded, you know, we he had a lot of uncles, my, my, my granduncles, that were all big scholars. They were interested in study, but they couldn't afford it at the time. So they encouraged him. So, you know, people funded him. Again, there was a bit of mortgaging of houses back in those days, lending a bit of money, the family sends you off. And my dad, and in return, my dad over the years, I've met so many people that have said dad influenced them about having an international study experience. And and I think there's, dad's no longer with us, but I think if there was one thing, and we haven't got a lot in common because I'm quite a different person from my dad. But one of those things has been, I think, that journey about international education or education full stop is something I've carried on. That's so touching, isn't it? It's like you feel this connection to the old man in some way. It's this be- beautiful way that he opened the world. You know, to, yeah, well, in so certainly opened up the eyes, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, incredible. Did, did they have people that sort of helped them along that journey, you know, like that helped educate them on what the options were or? I don't think so. I, mean, I think you might have spoken to, you know, a couple of um, academics around who may have had some sort of time offshore doing some research, perhaps. But no, I mean, a lot of it was written letters, applying and asking and going and talking to people and jump, buying a one-way ticket and then figuring it out. I'm just fascinated by, yeah, by how these stories evolve, yeah. right? I mean, s- some of us are lucky and, you know, you end up with the right mentor at the right time and they, they sort of are able to steer you in the right direction. They know somebody that's over there and boom, the door opens for you. And, and, and then this other side of the coin, which is just like, no, you literally have to hustle for it all yourself. But, you know, Rob, even now, I think in the, in the day of the internet and Facebook and social media and, and podcast and all of that, I still think that a lot of international students, whilst they see and read and hear about all this stuff online, I think there's an element of that adventure that's still the same. It's the unknown, right? Unless you've got a, a sibling or a relative or an auntie and uncle, and many of them do, uh, that are in Australia, particularly now with second generation, you know, people being here. But, but I, I think that We'd be surprised if you actually spoke to international students how daunting that journey is, even with all of the information at their fingertips, because the food's different. You don't know anyone, you know, like the rice isn't the same or uh, it's it's just a really daunting experience. And, and I think that's what we've all got to always remember is that we've got to we've always got to be able to empathize because that journey is not an easy one. Who have your mentors been? Oh, Rob, look, Gabrielle, for me, course. Gabrielle, Your of wife. course, yeah, yeah. Gabrielle has been a, an amazing mentor, you know, I mean, for me, being able to come in as a HEO5 international admissions officer, and then within six months, have an opportunity then to move into a regional manager role, which is where I started my recruitment, you know, she had, she saw something there, she encouraged it, she continues to encourage it. And, and for me, I've always said that I wouldn't be where I am today without Gabrielle. But following those years, you know, I've had some, some really amazing informal mentors over the years you know I look at people like uh, Rob Lawrence as a very strong mentor I remember going to my first AIEC in uh, 2007 and watching Rob talk and deliver his you know student of the Asians at the report and and going man this guy is like the godfather he knows everything about international education and fast forward 20 years later I would not have picked that I'd be sitting around exchanging text messages, having a bottle of wine, chatting about the industry, Rob and doing stuff that we do. And we've done some amazing work together in those years. So Rob Lawrence, another one, Stephen Connolly. You know, Stephen was, again, at the time when I started, Stephen was the chair of the AUIDF and I think probably vice president of IEA at the time. And I used to think, man, this guy knows everybody. He knows everything. Heidi Piper you know, from Griffith. She she will not like me calling her a mentor because it'll probably age her for, for saying that. But but Heidi was very early, you know, when I was working at Study Link at Griffith, Heidi taught me what sort of a manager I should be and what I wanted to aspire to. So Heidi was a, another one. But I've, I've had some really good mentors, Rob, over the years, people I've worked with. And, and I think mentoring for me has also come not just from looking up at leaders. You know, I've got some f- I've had fantastic leaders over the years, but also the people around me. You know, I've got some amazing members in the team that I look at and I go, you just push me to be better. And I, I see that as some form of mentoring as well. So I've been very privileged to work with amazing people over the years. And my my the way I view it is I, I can learn from people and I need to learn from people. And I try to, as best as I can, pick the good what I'd like to do and follow but I also am very quick to identify what I don't like and make sure that I don't emulate that with my team so it's been a a hell of a journey around leadership. What advice would you have for somebody that's because mentoring up is hard I mean you're going to brush this off as a comment mate you're you're an extraordinary human being when I've talked to people (laughs) and I'm talking with Rishan having on the podcast people like Rishan is the nicest guy in international education <laughs> i'm not going to name names but it's it's well more than one person has said that you're so generous you know and when i've sat down with you you've you've given me these amazing insights that i know a lot of people in the industry would net would just be like oh no sorry i can't can't talk to you about that stuff and you know like this is helping me develop and me to improve so clearly like this is something that's really important to you how do you think people can go about sharing that upwards it's hard to t- you know, to give advice upwards, particularly some people upwards don't like taking that information. <laughs> but any advice about how to, how to do that better? First of all, Rob, thank you. That's very kind for you to say that. Advice on what to do when you manage up. I think for me, if you are genuine in offering advice or feedback uh, and you want to mentor up that way, I think it's about how that's done. It's about 
the way that it's delivered. And I think there is a lot of opportunities of delivering that message up in a non-confrontational way, using examples. But I think if you're at that stage where you have that relationship, and I think you've got to pick who you mentor up to, right? Because not everyone, like you said, Rob, is going to take it really well. But if you've got a genuine relationship, I mean, for me, I can go to Gabrielle and honestly say to her, that is a shit idea and it's not going to work. And we can do that. And and we've been lucky enough that, I, that I've been lucky enough that I've got people around me at all levels that I can do that with, where we can question. We've, 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 you know, I've been at University of South Australia now for eight years and we've, we've got an environment where we can question each other, we can feedback, we can provide that mentoring up. But I, I think I'd flip the question a little bit. I would encourage people in positions in that senior, if you want to call it senior or leadership, role to be more open about taking that feedback on because if we can encourage more of that then feeding it up isn't so much of an issue right because it is challenging but I think if you pick your battles and how to deliver the message and build the relationship then I think the time will come when you can feed those up and I think honesty is the best way to do it non-emotional providing an honest feedback and I think a lot of times most often than not people take that reasonably positively and if they don't I'd then be questioning whether those are the people you want to be mentoring up to or not. Very good, very good question. I always feel grateful when one of my team speaks up and says, oh, you've missed this, or, or that's no good over here, we need to think about that. Because it's just the stuff that you don't have, you don't have in your side mirrors. You, you're not seeing it. And so every time someone speaks up, you're like, okay, that's great. You know, you, you heard the expression like when people, people point out to you that there's a problem with you, they're usually right. But usually the response or the, the idea that they have to fix that is usually wrong. <laughs> and you know what's the other bit that I subscribe to, Rob? I really subscribe to the whole concept of leadership, which is surround yourself with people that are smarter than you or know more than you, right? I, and I think my team is an absolute testament to this. They are all experts in the field of what they do. They do it well and they're country experts or they're learning abroad experts or they're transnational experts or whatever they are. But, and... I've got to a stage, I think, in my career that I'm not intimidated if people know more. Because at the end of the day, I subscribe to the thought that if they do good, it makes me look good, we all win out of this, right? So I work really hard on recruiting hard and then managing very easy. I, I tend to be a very hands-off manager. I tend to be there. I need to know what's going on because I, I, I like to know what's going on. But I let them run the show and they tell me what they do. And, and more often than not, they tell me when I'm wrong, if I'm out to make some wrong decisions. And so my focus is on the people and the rest of the technical stuff stays with the, the experts. It's definitely one of the hallmarks, I think, of, I've seen the people who've worked, who work with you. People love working with you and they're like, they love being part of the team. You run good teams. What's the special source in the recruitment process? You've said recruit hard. So what is that special source when you recruit? When we, when we joined, when I joined the university, we had an amazing director of HR at the time, Ruth Blankram, and there was a, a, a sort of a policy or a document, some, some fundamentals that we adopted at UniSA. And there were four bits that we had to, um, to look out for. You know, would they fit in the culture? Do they find solutions? So it was always about, well, there was a come for the others, I, I, I don't even think about them anymore. But the point that I'm making there, Rob, is um, it was recruit to values. Recruit to values. And it was values that we put as important as an organization. So for me, I think I've always gone out looking for people that, as I said earlier, are counselors. Not You can teach technical bits and pieces can't teach attitude you know so it's it's all those little bits and I, I I don't know I think over the years I think it really is there's an element of magic or, or there's an element of luck but I I'm a big believer in intuition and gut and and I just we I tend to rec run those interviews pretty hard but you know in 17 years in the sort of in the industry and probably 10 of those now in leadership roles I've only I think I've only ever made two bad hires and, and that was just unfortunate. The rest of them have been pretty good. So I do rely a bit on intuition, a little bit on gut, but I'm, I'm looking for attitude. I'm looking for generosity of time. I'm looking at authenticity. I'm looking at honesty. Uh, I'm looking at humbleness, empathy. There's just stuff in the questions that we ask and we talk, and we tend to do more than one interview. A lot of it's a formal one, and then we do a little bit of a chat, whatever. But, it's, and, but also, I kind of believe, particularly in leadership roles here in the international office at UniSA, you've got to do your apprenticeship. So we tend to bring people through the ranks. And I think because that's how I've come up, you know, from that HEO5 to where I am today, I've had to work along the way. And so we do a lot of internal management sort of hiring and promoting because we think 
They understand the business. They know what we're about. They've cut their teeth. They've done the hard yards. And so we, we tend to do that with a lot of our hires. People like that, don't they? Because everybody wants to feel like they've got a future. People want to be able to see the future. They want to be able to see the future. They want to know that there is security and that there is reward for loyalty. And, and, and I think that's the way it is. I mean, if you look at our management team here, many of the managers in the team were international students themselves, right? They, they studied at UniSA, so they believe in it. And then they've worked their way through different roles across the university to be where they are today. And I, and I say this, and this is no disrespect at all to other international officers out there, and, and, and there's some great ones, but, and we're very blessed with the people we've got. One of the other things you're involved in, Rishin, you're involved in the AUIDF. So for those who, who might not know it, the Australian University's International Directors Forum, you're on the exec. Tell me about that organisation. It's therapy, Rob. <laughs> it, it, it's like this virtual sofa, right, the AUIDF. I, I call it that. It's cathartic. You know, for an industry that is the size of what we have, we don't really have many avenues to to share and talk. I mean, we've got wonderful things like AIC and the IAA Symposium and the various different international conferences out there. But when you are an international director, there are a lot of challenges that you've got to go through that you often don't have an opportunity to bounce uh, off with people, right, and, and have conversations. And the AUIDF is like this safe haven. It's, you know, the 40 of us, as many as many as we can. Often it's, it's a bit less than 40, it's 30-something. But we catch up four times a year, a couple of times in person, a couple of times virtually. And it, it's one of those forums where you can say anything. Nothing's recorded. We have conversations. Um, we work through issues. We often are comparing notes about issues we face and problems and challenges we face. It's just a group of people that do the same sort of work, that face the same sort of challenges, that are able to share experiences and share their um, advice with each other. It's a safe zone, Rob, really. I mean, there's a, the, the rest of the group's probably going to get grumpy with me for oversimplifying what I see the AUIDF, but the most value that I get out of the AUIDF is being able to know that we are not alone when we face a problem or that someone's been through it before, or someone's seeing the same sort of issues and we work on solutions, we work on highlighting issues out there, we work on, on problems we face and it's just a, it's a wonderful group of people that are just there for each other really in its simplest form. Do you have any other kind of go-to strategies for dealing with stress and pressure? I mean, big role that, that you're in, important role for the institution, pressure must mount up. Do you have other things that you like to do to just kind of deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I'm probably not the best advocate, Rob, in terms of stress, right? Because I've learned over the years that I, I don't deal well with it. But one of the things for me... That's so, so, so interesting, Rishin, because you seem like the most chill dude on the planet. And I know people listen to this and just be like, yeah, he's right, right. Rishan is definitely the most chill dude on the planet. Yeah, if you ask Alicia that, she'll tell you a whole different <laughs> story, Rob. But, you know, I, I, th this was an interesting one. When Stephen Connolly was mentoring me, we were having chats and, and I said, he said to me, Rish, are you really the extrovert that you are out there? And I said, no, Rob. I said, Stephen, it challenges me. I get tired. And... Stephen reminded me, he said, you're always having to be on in your role, but really what you need is the opportunity to just switch off and recharge by yourself. And I never thought about it that way. So now I actually make conscious efforts, Rob, particularly after really busy weeks, especially after travel where you're having to be on for two weeks on a go or 10 days and, and you're putting on a show, right? You have to. For me, it's my Saturdays. I, I do an early morning central market shop. I go to the markets. It makes me happy. I buy what I need. I do the groceries, uh, one part of the groceries from home. And then I spend most Saturday afternoons after doing a couple of errands and dropping the boys at sport and so on. I, I spend Saturday afternoons cooking. And, and that's my happy space. I, I cook. I have music on. And we've got a weird tradition at home, Rob. I play the music of the cuisine. So if it's a pasta or a, or a, or a, a, a ragu afternoon, it's Italian classical music. If I'm cooking an Indian curry, I play sitar music from, from India. And it's just one of those things. And it's become a bit of a tradition. The boys have a laugh and Alicia laughs at me. But 
it's just the happy place. I open a bottle of wine, I cook that afternoon, and then Saturday night dinners, we have as much as we can together. And I try and do the same thing on a Sunday. But Saturday afternoon is my quiet time. Alicia goes out to Pilates, the boys are at sport, and I get two or three hours just by myself where I'm not making decisions. I'm not responding to people. I'm not having to strategize or, or, or write. I just have that quiet time. And I found in recent years, that's what that the, the combination of going to the markets, coming home, planning to cook, cooking and having a glass of wine is my, my escapism. That's my happy place. This is such a beautiful thing, man. Like, <laughs> I just, I, it's so true. Like we, everybody needs just that kind of like little room that you can go into and close the door. And we're all different. Like for you, it's cooking. For me, it's going out and trail running. But, but, but if you don't have it, I think very quickly you can run into this dangerous place where the stress is just building and you, you actually forget how to disconnect from it. You're just always plugged into it and that's just not healthy. Not healthy at all, no. And this, as you said rightfully, Rob, this is high stress. People think, oh, you know, you work for a university, it's public service, there's no stress, there's always government money. It ain't the case, mate. You know, you if you're tasked to bring in 250 million, 500 million a year, you've got to bring in 250 million. You've got people, you know, you've, you've got staff, you've got to manage those staff. Universities are tough places to be now, you know. Budget cuts happen, you lose staff. You, and you talk to a lot of directors out there that have had to make some pretty tough calls in the last couple of years. No, it's, it's high stress. You've got to find an outlet, whatever it is. Okay, Rishan, so you've been here for 20 plus years you've got this amazing team working in a great university awesome job what advice would you go back and give 2002 Rishan standing in that hotel in Ipswich if I could go back and have a conversation Rob there's, there's a couple of things I think I'd tell myself one is this will get better and and this is destiny and it will happen and it will turn out real good. Because there were times where it was tough. You know, it was hard being away from home. It was tough because, you know, I wasn't flush with cash. But also to remind myself that I will meet some amazing people that will change my life. And to just look out for them because they're going to come and they're going to come hard and fast. The other one is actually a little bit more personal, Rob. I often look back and think... If I could go back and tell myself at a younger age and give myself one bit of advice, it would be keep active and be, keep the sport going. I moved to Brisbane and got hurt playing rugby at the time. And at the time as a poor international student, the thought of going to a hospital to get my knee looked at and checked, which I finally did and was told I'd torn a, uh, an ACL in my knee. I didn't have the money at the time nor did insurance cover an operation on my knee, right? So 20 odd years ago when I did the injury, I ignored it and I never got it fixed. And as a 42 year old man now, um, I'm paying for that, you know, and I'm trying to do all the right things to, to, to sort of work that through. So I think for me, the best advice I'd give myself is just keep that activity. For someone that did so much sport, you know, I was heavily involved in Taekwondo. I played a lot of rugby. I did a lot of sport uh, throughout school. I sort of let that go a little bit and I wish I didn't because it's been a hell of a lot harder to get back on and get disciplined around it. So I think for me to be look after yourself more physically would be the best advice I wish I could go back and give myself. Rish, it's so good having you on the Global Horizons podcast and I, I hope you get that trip to Italy really soon. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Rob. Thanks for your time, mate. Ciao. Today's guest on the Global Horizons podcast has been Rishan Shekhar from the University of South Australia, true legend in Australian international education. Thanks for joining me on today's episode. And if you've got a recommendation for a guest or something that you would like to hear on our podcast, feel free to send me an email, rob at globalsociety.com.au. And until next time, have yourself an awesome day. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com.au.